Has anyone been to any of my presentations yeah. before? Yeah. Some have. <laughs> I'm, I paid. I paid the front row to see. Right? <laughs> I feed them well, and I give their yeah. I the Shram fam. fam. Yeah, I'll tell lots of Shram fam stories. Uh, so, oh yes, my biggest fan right here is like Dr. Dave. So I'm excited to be here. Uh, my name's Dave Shram, Dr. Dave. Um, so a little bit of background. Uh, Originally from Payson, my wife and I, good old from Payson, Utah, that's how we say it down there. And I went to BYU in my undergrad, I actually came to Utah State for my master's degree, so I'm an Aggie, and then I went to Auburn University, and I was a Tiger, so Auburn University for my PhD, and then to Missouri, I went to good old Mizzou, Mizzou Tigers, for nine years, I was a professor and extension specialist there, and then came back three years ago this month. Back to Utah State, so I'm just thrilled. So I'm a professor here on campus in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies, also an extension specialist, meaning I take the research, uh, develop programs, and take it, out to the, take it out to the people. I go on Fox 13 once a month and going on next Tuesday. I talk about happiness and positivity and parenting and marriage and family stuff. Um, when I arrived, Governor Herbert appointed me to serve on Utah's Commission on Marriage, so I get to go down and help influence policy and all kinds of good stuff. Uh, on that commission on marriage. So I remember though, my, and some of you have to bear with me if you've heard me share this, but for those who haven't, I graduated from Auburn, go to Mizzou, my first semester I'm teaching class is huge auditorium, like 240 students, these, these mass classes, and midway through the semester I came home and I said, honey, it's the funniest thing, they call me Dr. Dave. And my daughter at the time, Mallory, one of our daughters, she just starts to giggle, she's about five years old, and she says, dad, you're not a doctor. Actually, Mallory, right? I've been to 10 years of school, and I help people. And she looks at me, and she says, Dad, you're not a doctor. You don't help anybody. Uh, <laughs> ouch, right? Help your room, young lady. Why, why, what was she thinking? Why would she say that? Yeah, me medical doctor. Yeah, the kind that really help people, the scrubs and the stethoscope. So I thought, ah, you know, the rest of my life, I'm really going to prove her wrong, and I'm going to try to help people. So that's really what I do is I try to, to help people. And they start out. Most of you are, all y'all are from around here. Was this like a, it felt like a really long winter. Does it feel like a long winter to you? It just was like so, and now it's been kind of a cool spring, which is, which is nice. I'm not complaining. Nice, cool weather, open the windows at night. But it just felt like a really long winter. So here's Harold and Marge. Harold and Marge, they're from, they're from Nibley. They're from, no, they're not. <laughs> Looks like it though, right? And they are, it's long winter, and in January they say, man, we've got to get out of here. So they buy some tickets, they go down to Florida where they celebrated their honeymoon like 45 years earlier. So, but their schedules didn't line up. So Harold, he had to fly down the day before on Friday, and Marge, she was going to fly down on Saturday. So Harold, he gets into the hotel, he checks in, he's like, wow, look at this, I can't wait for her. You know, I'm going to send her an email. So he goes and he sends Marge an email, and without realizing his error he left out one letter in her email address and then he hit send and he didn't realize it meanwhile a widow in houston <laughs> meanwhile she comes home from her husband's funeral her husband was a pastor at their church she comes home just devastated she opens up her email expecting messages from family members and loved ones and friends and upon reading the first email she faints she screams she passes out her son comes rushes into the room he looks at the screen and it says i've arrived <laughs> He says, hey, honey, I know you're surprised to hear from me. They have computers here now, and you're allowed to send emails to your loved ones. <laughs> I've just arrived and checked in. I see that everything has been prepared for your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing you then. Hope your journey is as uneventful as mine was. P.S. It sure is freaking hot down here. I love you, honey. So I, I love that. I love it. Have you ever done that? You've sent an email or text and you leave out, or autocorrect, that's even worse. You're like, oh my gosh, should I just say that? Yeah. So now why? Why would I begin a presentation with that? Why? And I try to do all my classes when I teach. I love to start with something, boom, that grabs their attention. Why? Because our brains, they love, it lights up the brain. Positivity and happiness, laughing, it lights up the brain. And I know that they've come from different places. Some of them have just yeah, bombed the test or broke up with a boyfriend. And they come into the class. And in order to really grasp them, there's got to be positivity. Because it turns on all the learning centers in the brain. In fact, every single measurable outcome that we know in the education and in the work industry 
shows that there are improvements when the brain is positive and happy and excited. So that's what I'm here to talk about. And you should have re all received a little bookmark in your bag of goodies. You received like 127 things. And here, happy hacks. And if you want more of these, just send me an email and I'll send you as many as you want for free, for free to give out to people. So happy hacks, bookmarks. I also have uh, different, today we're not talking about it, but I have one called Make Time for Nine. So I talk about like a parenting curriculum. Um, so that's there, as many as you want. Send me an email and I'll send you the whole presentation for free, bookmarks, wherever you want. So with extension, we take stuff and we just give it out for, for free. <coughs> so here, I love this study, this study, this positivity study. This one was done with Richard Wiseman, the newspaper study. So what he did is he had people fill out surveys like this, a class full of surveys. And some people, there were questions about, do you feel like good things happen to you? Do you feel like you're lucky? Uh, are you optimist, pessimism, that kind of thing. And then he gathered their surveys and then he gave them a task and he found out, he, he gave them each a newspaper and he said, all right, if you can tell me how many pictures are in this newspaper, get it accurately, then I'll give you $5. So, oh man, that's easy enough. And so the negative, the pessimists, those who felt they were unlucky, it took them on average about two minutes to find because they went through the newspaper, wanted to make sure, yep, 36 pictures and then they turned it in. Thank you very much, here's your $5. The optimists, those who felt like positive good things happened to them, it took them about 15 seconds. Because on page two in big two inch letters, it said, stop the study, there are 36 pictures, turn this newspaper in. I'm like, oh, sweet. Yeah, that was short, turn it in. Just for kicks on page 12, he put it again. Turn this in for $50 if you see this message and come turn it in and let me know. What? What happened? The negative people, negativity literally narrows us. We don't see as much. Positivity, it's called the broaden and build theory. It's one of my favorite books in this area. It's by Barbara Fredrickson. It's called Positivity. Just one word. <laughs> That's it. But she's the guru on positivity. It's called the broaden and build theory. That happiness and positivity literally broadens us up and we can see different perspectives literally see you can scan the newspaper now the negative people they actually had cameras and the, their eyeballs went over the letters but it didn't register in their minds because negativity narrows and it didn't it didn't capture that so there's something about this positivity here's the previous thinking on positivity and success happiness is the reward we get for doing our best we were actually taught that and some of us continue to teach that you know if you did your really your work your really best look how you'll be successful and then you'll get be then you're happy but this is, has been taught in our jobs, right? If we work really hard, then we'll be successful at work and then we'll be happy. Or in our relationships or in parenting, if we work really hard, success and then happiness. But new research in positive psychology and neuroscience shows that it works the other way around. When we're happy and positive first, it fuels every other success in life. So it can be happiness first and last. It can be through the whole thing. So increasing this, talking about resilience, increasing positivity, it does not mean just gloss over, oh, you had a, you know, you had a, a score of aces of five. Oh, I'm so sorry. Just smile and you'll be fine. That's not what I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. So that is not, def so I want to make sure that that's, that's not misunderstood. And positive psychology kind of gets a bad rap of, oh yeah, just smile and be happy. And no, 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 no. They're real life things. But in order to cope with some of those, Positivity sure helps, and it helps broaden our perspective. So it's happiness, better employee, parent, partner, every outcome that we know how to measure for at work and in education has shown that this is true. So happiness pie, about half of our happiness research shows on average is we're inherited. So you can either blame your parents or thank your parents for a little slice of your happiness. About 10% of our happiness is our circumstances, how much education, the current car you drive, the, ha the house, oh, I got a new iPhone. But we get used to, it's called hedonic adaptation. We adapt to almost every single thing in this life. We adapt, right? We get, go to divorce and we remarry. Oh, we get, it. we get used to this person. We get used to everything. Go on a nice vacation. Oh my goodness, look how wonderful this room is. There's a mint on the pillow. And by day three, you're like, oh my gosh, can't they give us another mint? This is the old. And we start complaining because we get used to things, don't we? So 10%. Now, traditionally, we've been taught that we are a product, product of our parents. genes. Yeah, our parents and our environment. We're a product of our genes and our environment. And that is true, but only about 60%. About 40%, we're about that 40%. 40% 40 
is our intention. These are our thoughts. These are our actions. These is our attitude. This is what we have control over. And for me, that excites me because I'm not just a product of, of my genes and the little circumstances of how rich or poor I am. This is it. So this is the 40% that, I, that I'm excited to share today. So first positivity pyramid. This is adapted from some of the Arbinger stuff. From some of you are familiar with Arbinger Institute here in Utah. They do great work. Up at the top of this is correction. And if I'm talking about parenting, then this is correction there. If it's in the office or we have interns or people or anything, it's correction. But a lot of times we spend a lot of of our focus is up here on correction. Regardless of the type of correction we do, we'll always depend on our prior teaching. We do a better job of teaching and we'll do less correction. We'll still need it, but it'll be a natural extension of of our teaching. Those will go hand in hand. Now, it took me a little while as a parent, I'm a little slow learner as a dad, that my children will not listen to me, regardless of I'm trying to teach them or the students in the classroom or anyone that will not listen to me unless, unless, unless they like me, unless I have a relationship with them. For example, everyone in your mind, think of someone that just drives you crazy. There's that person that you work with or someone else that you're like, oh my gosh, their personality, the way they talk, their, their mannerisms. So, everyone have that person in your mind? Okay. Now, tell me your name. Kathy, let's say that I'm that, oh, hopefully I'm not that person, but maybe I'm that person that just drives you crazy because I'm too excited and rambunctious and that drives you nuts. Now, if I come over here and I'm like, oh, Kathy, actually what you need to do here is, and I try to teach her something or correct her, and you, if you can't stand me and I walk away, what are you going to do Make after I leave? Yeah. yeah, 90% of an eye, uh, percent chance of an eye roll, it's like, oh my gosh, and 10% chance of it, oh, he's such an idiot, yeah. when I go away. Because if you don't like somebody, the way that they hold their fork can drive you nuts. If you do like somebody, they can dump their whole lunch in your lap, and you're like, oh, hey, no, that's fine. That's, what, that's no problem. Isn't that true? It's, it's real. It's true. Because it automatically, if there's no relationship there, forget about any kind of teaching. It won't go well. Underneath this is a positive, happy person. People like happy people. Most of us do. So this in all your relationships, relationships with other people at home, at your work, positive. How many of you love hanging around just ornery, cranky, grumpy, sarcastic, <laughs> negative people? Well, sarcastic maybe a little bit. But it does. You're like, oh, hey, yeah, this, this person drives me nuts. But it's this. Improving this spills over into these other areas in our, in our lives. So what are some barriers to positivity? All kinds of barriers. We just talked about some. Ace is a huge, huge barrier. It doesn't mean we can't be positive and happy, but man, it, it's, it's more difficult, isn't it? Here are a bunch of others. How many of you heard of HALT? Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. HALT, yes. Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? These, these tend to add up and more aces. It's more difficult than to see, just have perspective or to see anything that's, that's outside of that. Digital distractions, what are we confronted with a lot in families today? Man, they're battling this one. This one is huge. I was just in, in Hawaii, presenting in Hawaii. I know, it's a tough job. Somebody has to, <laughs> Hawaiians, they need right, help too. So I was in there having a great time. We went to Duke's. Anyone been to Duke's? Sunday? There's a couple in California and some in Hawaii. Great restaurant. I go to Duke's. We're having a great time I'm with my wife and sister-in-law, brother-in-law, some friends, eating dinner, and I look over and I see it. I see it. This family, this family, dad like this, mom like this, son like this, just three of them sitting there on their phones. I look over here, there's a couple eating dinner on his phone the entire meal. He just sat there and scrolled. The only time I saw him interact was when he laughed at something he saw and he showed his wife. <laughs> oh my gosh. Before that, back in November, I took the Shram fam to San Diego. I was presenting in San Diego. And we go out to a Mexican restaurant, the Shram fam. We're having a great time. And I look over and I see a father and son. I say, oh, that's great. Well, dad, you know, date with dad. And he's going out. And then the dessert comes. And this is all I saw the entire, the entire time. He's eating his dessert the entire time. There was not one word said between them. He sat on his phone the entire time. Ah, oh, drove me crazy. And then they got up and left. This is the same table, exact same table. Notice who comes and sits down. Same table, same background. Oh, man. They come down and immediately both on their phones. And I, so I take a picture and then they're like, Dad, you're not paying attention to us. And they're like, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, kids. I'm like, yeah, I should have shut up and put my phone down because, yeah, it starts to drive me crazy. There's so much technology. It's called technoference. 
Technoference, when technology interferes with human relationships. Technoference. And, it, and it's all over the place, isn't it? So this is one of those distractors and barriers to, to happiness as well. Stress. Stress is another barrier. Stress is another barrier. Some of you have seen this study. This is a study of 30,000 adults followed for eight years. So these studies are pretty rare. Stanford study, eight-year study, 30,000 adults. They were asked several questions, two of which were these. The first one, how much stress did you experience in the past year? Raise your hand in this room, be honest, if you experienced a lot of stress in the past year. Whoa, man, look at the around. <laughs> From work? Yeah, a lot of you are in the healthy field and it's, and it's work and it's stressful because you, you help, you interact with people and you're involved with human lives and that, that's stressful. So it turns out that those who experienced a lot of stress in the past year, the following year, they experienced a 43% increased risk of dying the following year. So what does that mean? It does not mean that 43% of you who just raised your hand are not going to be here next year for our company. That is, that is not what that means. That's not what that means. This was only true for those, the second question, do you believe stress is harmful to your health? Those who strongly agreed and they said, yeah, oh yeah, I know, I've seen the studies and the stress, it just totally kills you. Now, this statistic was only true for those who answered both of those questions. How much stress did you experience in the past year? If they experienced a lot of stress and they believe that stress is harmful to your health, that combination is the 43%. Who experienced the lowest risk of death across the whole study? Those who experienced a lot of stress but did not believe that stress is harmful to your health. It was that combination. That was, they experienced lower than those who experienced even low stress. What? What does that mean? It means that there's about 20,000 people that die each year, not from stress, but from believing that stress is harmful to your body. What? It's the 15th leading cause of death. Kills more people than HIV. Is believing that stress. So th- when you change your mind about stress, you change your body's response to stress. You like Kelly McGonigal, she, she gives a TED Talk on this. Some of you have seen that. Great, great TED Talk. So Kelly McGonigal, Stanford University, wonderful TED Talk on this. So the human brain, the human brain receives about 11 million pieces of information every second from our environment. So you may be looking up here and you see this, but you see this and this kind of stuff is over here, the exit sign, you have internal signals, I use the bathroom, I should have grabbed another Twix when it went by, where's the bowl of candy? <laughs> All this stuff is coming at you. But you can really only focus on 40 bits of information every second. For example, none of you right now are thinking of your left pinky toe. Now you are, now you are, now you are. But you weren't before because your 40 bits were right here, and then it was over here. We can really only concentrate on about 40 bits of pieces of information, but 11 million is coming at you at all times. When I first saw this research, I had to put it down. I was like, whoa, what does that mean? It means we, we get to choose what to focus on and what to dismiss or ignore. But we're wired to focus on what? Negative. The negative. It's called the negativity bias. So all those 80... So 100 billion is right, Dr. Ed Red was talking about. Research actually shows it's more closely, it's about 86 billion brain cells, neurons that we're, that we're born with. And we're born with five times as many that are wired for negativity and threat for every one that is wired for opportunity and positivity. So already it's a five to one negativity bias. And I can prove it. Your child comes home with report card time and they've got five A's and a C minus. Where's your brain go? It goes right. It goes right to the C minus, huh? They're like, Mom, but look at health, and I turn this paper in, and oh, you go right, and you just realm, and what happened in math? And I thought you were going to talk to your teacher and retake that test, and we just go right on the negative, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's this negativity bias. Your reality is a choice. Those forty bits, you get to choose. You get to choose those. Now, there's a lot of things that influence, and those who've been through trauma and all kinds of crummy stuff, they're really emphasize it's that negativity. It's like that if you have anyone ever chipped your tooth or you've got uh, and you keep your tongue keeps going back to it and it starts getting cut up. Mm-hmm. You keep going back to it or the loose tooth. You just keep wiggling it, wiggling it, wiggling it. Even though it's not good for you, we keep going back to that. Negative we're drawn to that. We focus on it. We rehearse over and over in our minds. You go through a performance evaluation review. Mm-hmm. Yeah, twenty eight minutes of just praise, wonderful things, and the last two minutes. Oh actually Kathy, before you go we really need you to step it up right here. And then we take one negative thing that you've done, and then you leave, what are you focusing on? You that it's that one stinking negative thing. 
we're just, ah. Oh. It is like negativity is like Velcro in our brains. And positivity is like Teflon. It just comes and it goes right off. So it means that, here's the trade-off. I can think about negatives with my 40 bits. And if I'm thinking about negatives and dwelling on and all the past and all the horrible stuff that has happened, I rehearse it and I talk about it over and over with this therapist and this person and this and all about my horrible situation, then our brain gets stuck in that cycle and our 40 bits are absorbed there. But if we can learn to focus on some of our 40 bits on the positive, change our mindset, choose to think more about the positive, the good things around me, that begins that upward spiral of positivity. So that's what we'll be talking about Oh, first, five to one, right? We're five times likely to notice negative and see what? Mistakes. Yeah, we're more likely to see mistakes. How many of you saw it? What, did you notice it? Your brains just go right. Here's the, all the negative people in the room. They saw it first and they noticed it. The positive people are still wondering what's going on here. What's wrong with this guy? Yeah, I'm just funny. I can't see anything. Yeah, my mind put the S in there. It is. Yeah, this is true. You look at your, your garden or your lawn or anything and you notice weeds or you notice the brown spot, we notice the negative. But you can rewire the brain. You can train the brain to find the positive. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you've seen this, if you haven't. Everyone do your finger curl. Go like this. Yes, finger curls. Finger curls. So this study with finger curls, three groups of volunteers. Don't, don't volunteer for these kinds of studies, by the way. <laughs> Three groups of volunteers. One, they all come in, all the volunteers, they come in and they pull the lever and it measures their finger strength. Mm -hmm. So they come in, they initially pull the lever, they write that down, okay, here's your, your baseline. And then group one, finger curls. You need to do this 15 minutes a day, five days a week for how long? 12 weeks. What? <laughs> they better pay them really well. So they're doing this. Yeah, I mean, that gets annoying. Just, yeah, just one hand, just one hand. Yep, doing this, finger curls. Group two, they come in, they pull the lever, and then they're instructed to visualize finger curls. Visualize. I don't know which one's worse. Yeah. Honey, what are you doing? I'm just doing my finger curls. <laughs> in my hand. Yes, it's that dang study. Don't do those studies. Group three, they pull the lever, instruct. They don't know anything, so they go, they're the control group. They go home. All right, 12 weeks later, everyone come back. And they pull the lever again. So group one, 53% increase in finger strength. Can you imagine walking around? Look at these sausages, man. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> dude, what happened to your finger? Oh, man, it was finger curls. You should try it. It's like it's twice as big as all the other fingers. <laughs> you should do it with thumbs. 53% huh? yeah. increase in finger strength. Group three, no increase. Group two, those who just visualized it, what was there? 40. Holy smoke, 35% increase in finger strength. So, what does this mean? It means you can forget your gym pass, and all you have to do is just visualize. Just think about this. Yes. No, I have a, I'm going to open up a gym, and it's going to have nothing in it, no equipment. Just come on in, man. People are going to be le oh, yeah. Yes. I know, yeah. Yeah. How do you think I got this body? Yeah. <laughs> Zero exercise. It's all up here. No, real exercise really does. Now, they, some of you are thinking, oh, I'll bet some group two are a little bit doing a little of this action. They, so they did another study. They did it with men's biceps, and they put them in a cast this time. So they couldn't cheat even if they wanted to. Again, don't volunteer for these studies, guys. I mean, walk around with a cast. Oh, what happened to your arm? Oh, I'm just in a study. <laughs> so, man. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. But it was it was it was thirteen it was thirteen point five percent increase just by thinking about the curls. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. So thinking about exercise activates the same areas of the brain as real exercise. Yeah, pretty amazing. So do this when you go home tonight. Just stand against the wall and tell your sweetheart's like, honey, what are you doing? Honey, I'm on mile thirteen of a marathon. Just give me a water. I'm dying over here. <laughs> Visualize your exercise. <laughs> yeah. So the other day, my, my son, we're telling him, like, hey, buddy, go brush your teeth. And he's like, because he knows about this. He's like, I just visualized it, Dad. And the plaque just came up. <laughs> mm -hmm. just get back in there and you do that. Yeah, it does not happen. It does not happen. The plaque does not just fall off from visualizing. So here are some happy hacks. Happy hacks. 21 days. Why 21 days? That's how long yeah, it takes to build a habit. And, that, and I, I dug a little bit deeper between that. 
uh, into that and found out that our, most of the cells in the human body regenerate about every 21 days. So when you actually do something different, it takes about 21 days. So right now, none of your cells 21 days ago are the same. Your hair and your skin and all that flakes off and all that is continuous. So when you become, you're practicing kindness, you're becoming, trying to become more grateful, you're doing it and it's becoming part of you, of literally who you are into your cellular structure. How cool is that? So that's why, that's why 21 days is it takes time to get all that into you and you're changing everywhere. You're a different person. So here are, here are some of those. Uh, meditation and mindfulness. This one, is, this one is the real deal. And we just paused and we did some of that, right? Yoga and that being in the moment, deep breaths. This really, and meditation has been around for thousands of years, but now the research is catching up and showing that meditation actually increases the thickness of the gray matter in your brains. You want gray, thick gray matter. That is the area that is more <laughs> compassion, compassion and empathy and focus and our attention span increases. That is what mindfulness and attention. No wonder that Google has, Google has a, uh, what do they call it? It's not a CEO of happiness. It's a something of happiness. Like that's really their job. And it's, at Google, they all take, they take their hands off the keyboards about every hour and they just whoo, take some breaths. It's like this t- little two minute, just kind of reset themselves. Yep, and then back at it. Yeah. yeah. They also have sushi and all kinds of other fun things. But, but the meditation, meditation and mindfulness. Yeah, the real deal. Um, why? Because our minds tend to wander a lot. So mindfulness, being in the moment, our minds tend to wander a lot. In fact, one research study showed on average about 47% of the time when you're engaged in an activity, you're thinking about something else other than what you're doing. For example, how many of your minds have wandered it, just in the time that I've talked? You're looking up here and you're smiling. Your minds are somewhere else. How many? <laughs> how many? rest of you are liars, man. You're all liars. <laughs> No, I shouldn't, my wife keeps telling me, you shouldn't call people liars, that's not nice. You're not telling the truth, you're not telling the truth. Our minds wander a lot. Our minds wander a lot. From 67% down in grooming, self-care, when you got ready this morning, when you're doing your makeup, your hair, your shower, were you actually thinking about what you're doing? No. No, your mind's going, which is good, because a lot of some of the creativity and stuff happens, so it's okay. Commuting, when you're driving, yeah, you, sometimes you end up at home or you end up, you're like, wow, how did I get here? You're, you're not thinking. Listening to music, doing housework, working. I'm, I'm working, I'm working. No, you're not. About half the time you're thinking about something else other than what you're doing. Shopping, taking care of your kids. How many of you are guilty? Your child comes up and says, oh, mom, guess what happened to me? It's school today. And they tell you, and you're like, oh, that's great. And, but, no, honey, I, mom, I got beat up. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> what? What were you saying? Yeah, you're not listening. Your minds are wandering. You're on your phone. You're scrolling through, reading, eating. Yeah, or my exercising, talking with other people. You're just nodding and looking. And don't ask your partner about this one because you may not like what you hear about. <laughs> Yay, like, honey, is that true? And she didn't answer me. I thought, oh, wow. <laughs> Stay away. What predicts staying alive? There's a great BYU study, a meta-analysis. It's a study of studies, so big, long studies. They found that clean air is not very, you know, cash value. We complain about our clean air. It's not. When it's unhealthy, it's unhealthy. But on average, it's not a strong predictor. Hypertension treatment, being lean versus overweight. Exercise, except for real, studies have now shown that exercise actually belongs more down there. Real exercise really is good for us. <laughs> So they say. I just visualize this. Yeah. <laughs> Cardiac rehab, flu vaccine, did you get your flu shot? Yep, that predicts. That's pretty strong. Quitting drinking, quitting smoking, these are help us stay alive longer. Those are like, yep, no brainers. What about the last two? What do you think? What keeps us? <gasps> close relationships. Yeah, is number two. The power of our close relationships. Number one is it's actually quitting Fortnite. Quitting Fortnite is the number one thing. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not. I keep telling my son that. Social integration. It's this. It's this kind of stuff when you're with people. When you're with, it's the people who you meet and greet and smile and laugh with and go out to dinner or go to church or who. It's your group. It's your social connection. So these two are highly connected. But it is. It's the quality of our close personal relationship. Another wonderful TED Talk by Robert Waldinger. You need to listen to this one and then listen to it again over and over and over. Robert Waldinger, he is the longest um, study on happiness and um, well-being over time. 
They're like in their 80, 80th year. What makes a good life? He says this, the clearest message that we get from the 75-year study, which was a few years ago, gave this, good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. People who are more socially connected to family, to friends, to community, are happier, they're physically healthier, and they live longer than people who are less well-connected. And good relationships don't just protect our bodies, they protect our brains. So this social connections, and that's what they're talking about in there, right? Aces, you're familiar with aces, and I don't have time to jump into this study, but you need to become familiar with the health, it's the HOPE study. Health outcomes of positive experiences, is, it balances aces. So aces, adverse childhood experiences, health outcomes of positive experiences, HOPE, look up that study, because it shows that those who are most resilient from aces, it's this. They have at least one strong connection with a person, a human being, so they can, they can relate with. So it is this, this message that we need each other. We need people. Cherish your friends. Here's the Shram fam. Here's my wife, and here's all of our kids. This is how we stay in touch. No, no, no. Here's grandma. Here, look at Kinsley. She's like, hmm? Cherish your friends, human beings, these, these relationships that we have. Loneliness raises blood pressure to the point where the risk of heart attack and stroke is doubled. Emotional isolation is more dangerous health risk than smoking or high blood pressure. So um, you've heard of the epidemic, obesity ep epidemic. Do you know the new epidemic that they have just come up, they've talked about now, the last couple of years? The new epidemic is loneliness. It is loneliness. It is isolation, being alone. Being alone. In fact, they have a minister of loneliness in Great Britain. I kid you not. Look it up. Minister of loneliness because it's such a huge problem. At least all these other health problems. Because of close personal relationship is the strongest predictor of how long and how well you live in this life is the quality of your close personal relationships. The opposite of that is this isolation, this feeling of loneliness and not connecting. Which, yeah, some of the technology stuff, mm, getting lonely. Dr. Dean Orner says he knows of no other factor, not diet, smoking, exercise, stress, genetics, drug surgery that has such a major impact on quality of life, incidence of illness, and premature death from all causes. He doesn't say that these don't matter, but overall, when he looks at all the factors, he's like, wow, it is, it is connections. It is friends. It is those close people. That's what keeps us going more than anything. Discover and use your strengths. I'm a big fan, big fan of discovering and using your strength. Manage your weaknesses. Use your strengths. To discover, this is a freebie. VIA character or authentichappiness.org is another good one. That's just a great website to go check out. VIA character.org. So what this will do, it'll take about 15, 20 minutes. It's free. It's free. Take this. It'll kick out your five character strengths. Dr. Martin Seligman, some of you know that name, came up with 30 signature strengths. And they're not singing, dancing. They're things like creativity, the ability to love and be loved, gratitude, kindness, uh, forgiveness, and mercy. So there's a host of these. This will kick out your top five. It's called signature strengths. Now, I printed mine out, put it on a little piece of paper, and I have it taped underneath my screen at, at my work, my office here at Utah State. So I literally focus on my strengths every day. I see my strengths. So use your strengths, manage your, your weaknesses. Discover those. Gratitude. Gratitude is a huge one. This area has exploded. This is just a handful of these. From reduces aches and pains to thoughts about suicide, optimism, physical health, reduces anxiety. Wow. Just simply slowing down and being grateful. Being grateful for what you have. You've, some of you heard me talk about the five-minute journal app. I love it. I love it. So it's $4.99, but it's like the cheapest journal you'll ever get because it lasts forever. And you get to take a picture. So the five-minute journal app, you get to take a picture of the day. And in the morning, three things that you're grateful for. It pops up and it reminds you. At the end of the day at 8 o'clock, what amazing things happened today. And I get to jot down. And it literally takes me less than five minutes to capture that in. And I travel a lot, so I just take it with me. And nope, there it is. And I am able to document that. So I love this. Five-minute journal app. The gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. Big one. In fact, uh, another great TED Talk. This is one of Dave's faves. David Sandel Ross. He says in this TED Talk, in daily life, we must see that it is not happiness that makes us grateful. That's backwards. But gratefulness that makes us happy. He says, gratefulness is the key to a happy life that we hold in our hands. Because if we're not grateful, then no matter how much we have, we will not be happy. 
because we will always want to have something else or something more. I love that. Reminds me, so a BYU professor, he once taught this. He said, you can never get enough of what you don't need because what you don't need will never satisfy you. I love that. You'll never get enough of what you don't need because what you don't need will never satisfy you. I thought, oh yeah, all the stuff or gadgets, and then you'll always be wanting something else or something more, the latest or this, and it'll be, I'll be happy when. If I could just get this, I would, I would be happy. We'll always want to have something else or something. Gratitude, that contentment of enough, of this is, life is good right now, not this or that, or I need to have that. So this is, this is a freebie, and anyone can focus on, yep, in the now. What do I have? What do I enjoy? Exercising, diet, and sleep. This one is a, we just talked a little bit about real exercise really does, real exercise can reduce anxiety and stress by up to 20%. They've actually done some with Prozac. They've done Prozac and then exercise and done studies. They compared them. It's amazing. Yeah, real exercise is like a Prozac. It has that, that effect. can reduce anxiety and stress by as much as 20%. Yeah regular exercise and then just what we put the crap that we put in our in our bodies affects us our sleep there's been now over 10,000 studies just on sleep alone and how the importance of sleep because yeah we don't get to sleep and then it affects our mood and our crankiness and it spills over it affects um, so much more great TED talks I don't have enough time to talk about all the effects of sleep and what it does and the cells in our body they sh- in our brains they shrink and it fl- the fluid comes through and it flushes things out amazing stuff of actually what sleep does for us oh drop grudges yeah the forgiveness stuff this one can just drag us down when we get stressed and we have these we harbor this it affects our immune system our digestive st- system our metabolism s- systems all of this can be affected by the stress and this grudge of Ah, oh, but man, just harboring something against someone else is like drinking poison and then expecting that person to die. Dang it. Yeah, it, it doesn't. It is. It, it kills us. And it, it takes us yeah, in awful places. Quick story about um, dropping grudges. So a good friend of mine, I actually went to Utah State with him, Josh Smith. So we were in the student trailer court. Do you guys remember anyone here? Yeah, the student trailer court over there. It's demolished now. We lived over there for, for three years. Amazing. Some of our best memories. Josh and Emily Smith, they were there as well. So Josh had a rough background. Growing up, he was just tough time through um, grade school, middle school, and then into high school. He was bullied, thrown into dumpsters. His gym clothes were peed on. He was just awful, awful experiences that he had. In fact, he would eat his lunches in the bathroom. Every day. So he would eat his lunches in the bathroom. One day he's in high school, he's in line. Okay, by the way, set this up. I don't have enough time to tell it. Two of Josh's brothers died by suicide already. So now we have a mama that has two sons that have died by suicide. Josh is in line. A girl throws a piece of cake at Josh. This popular girl, he says, hit him in the face, frosting side, and then it falls off. He looks at the girl, and the girl says this. You are such a freak, Josh. You should do the world a favor and go kill yourself. What? What? So Josh runs off, of course, embarrassed, crying, runs to the bathroom, washes off his face, and he looks in the mirror for the first time. He has a serious thought about suicide. The next 16 years, Josh has these thoughts of suicide. Josh, um, then now he is in uh, Indiana. He is working on his Ph.D., his dissertation, he has an appointment with his advisor in October of 2010. His advisor says, I'm sorry, Josh, but um, this isn't, it's not good enough. You're not going to be able to, to graduate with his PhD. It devastates him. He has four kids, two with autism. And it's too much for Josh. He's like, man, my wife deserves something else. So on October 30th, 2010, Josh drives out to the Clark Memorial Bridge. It's 160 feet high. He walks out. He was the 50th person to jump off this bridge. The 47 died, two survived, and they are paralyzed. So Josh gets up, he jumps off the bridge. He lands in the water, it's in the evening, breaks eight ribs, shattered eight ribs, starts to drown, right, as he can't breathe, and a boat comes over and pulls Josh out of the water. Pulls Josh out of the water. Josh survives. Josh survives. He's resilient. He goes back. He gets his PhD. Now, fast forward a few years. Josh is practicing psychology. He's helping kiddos. He's a child psychologist. He's meeting with these kiddos. Now, this child that he's been meeting with for four weeks, on the fifth week, 
Dad comes to drop him off instead of mom. Dad drops him off. Josh looks him in the face and immediately recognizes this is one of the bullies from high school. This is one of the ones that was bullying him in high school. Their eyes connect. He sees it. The bully looks at Josh. Josh looks at the bully. And Josh said, man, it doesn't look like the apple falls far from the tree, huh? Because he was frustrated and sees this guy. And then he says, Josh, can I talk to you for a minute alone? So he goes into his office. And he says, Josh, I'm so sorry for the way that I treated you all those years in high school. One of my biggest regrets. I'm so sorry. And Josh starts to cry. And then he, Josh looks at this bully in the eyes. And he says, you know what? I forgive you. I forgive you. Because the bully says, you know what, I treated you like crap, but don't, please don't take it out of my son who's really struggling. He's being bullied at school for his, the struggles he's going through. But being able to drop grudges, just instantly being able to see that and to drop that grudge. I love this. Nelson Mandela, you know this. As I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. I'd still be in prison because he... The prison's right here. And that's, that's what it is. That's what we harbor that. We, ah, it cankers us. So dropping grudges. Research shows that this is so, so important for us and so good for our souls. Smiling. Everybody smile. After that story. Everybody smile. <laughs> okay, that's fake. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now that's your real smile. Your real smile releases dopamine. Your dopamine, which is that, that high. It is contagious. The 10-5 rule. The 10-5 rule is simply this. When you're within 10 feet of somebody, you smile. When you're within 5 feet of somebody, you say hello. 10-5 rule. Ritz-Carlton Hotel Chain. That's who came up with this. And then others have adopted this. At Walmart, right? Walmart. Yeah, They have a greeter there. Their, their purpose really is to, yeah, welcome to Walmart. Greet you with a smile. Have you noticed those? Some Walmart greeters, they're not doing their job, are they? <laughs> You're like, hey, mm -hmm. you're like, hey, right? You just want to go and, eh? I know what you're doing here. You're not slackers. Yeah, they need to do their job. Smile, smiling, smiling is smiling. So good for us. In fact, here's the power of smiling. When I'm going to show you a picture, I'm going to watch your reaction. Here it is. This is the picture automatically. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's just universal. Yeah. Any culture, they say they all oh, the same thing, sometimes with an accent. The power of smiling. It's real, but not all smiles are created equal. For example, if I show you this picture, it doesn't quite get the same, <laughs> the same reaction. Yeah, oh, it's like, oh man, what happened? Yeah, so we gotta get, get rid of that one. But real smiles, we have mirror neurons, and we see a smile, spit the, spit a baby smiling, and we smile, because the mirror neurons, we tend to reflect others. So when you're smiling, others will tend to, it could brighten their day, simply by, hey, yeah, but if you're creepy and you're like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> yeah, don't do that. No, don't do that. I might end up in jail. So children, how many, raise your hand in this room. How many of you smile at least 20 times per day, honestly? How many of you are smilers? You smile a lot. Yeah, good. So research shows only about one-third of adults smile 20 times per day. 14% of us adults only smile less than five. Fourteen percent smile less than five. I know, it's like, man, you just want to go tickle them and just be like, hey, hey, <laughs> smile, here, here, here's, a, here's a happy meal, here's a happy meal, all right, cheer you up. <laughs> Smiling. Apparently this little kid, he did not get the memo on this picture. <laughs> smile. Now, smiling can release as much dopamine as up to 2,000 bars of chocolate. Holy smokes. So smiling is really good for, and you don't get the calories. You just smile, <laughs> smile. I'm burning calories. It releases a lot of dopamine, yeah, and it's contagious. So smiling is really good for us. Power, they've done studies. that if, This is 114 pictures from 1958. So this is in Mills College in Oakland, California. They follow them. They follow them. So they surveyed them at 30, uh, 22, and at, and at 33, 42, and then at 52. So 30-year study, 22 to age 52. And they found out that those in the yearbook who had the biggest smiles was correlated to more relationship happiness to fewer health problems, lower likelihood of anxiety and depression, and they were viewed as more beautiful when people smile. You're actually viewed, yeah, prettier. They did another study. Baseball cards, baseball cards, 150 baseball player photographs. They just took a look just at their cards, and then they looked at when they died. 
Crazy, huh? Those who had, yeah, some of them were a little more grumpy than others. Those who, no smile on average, age 72. Yeah, the small smile, like the fake stewardess smile when you're on an airplane. Yeah, they're like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah. That, yeah, age 75. The big honkin smile, the real smile in these photographs, on average, they live to age 80. So there's something about it. So it doesn't mean that smiling makes you live longer, but there's a correlate about who you are and the happiness and the positivity that spills over into all these other outcomes. Practice kindness, kindness, random acts of kindness. In fact, we're going to do one right now. Everyone, pull, If you have a phone, pull that out, and I want you to, you're going to text somebody. You're going to send them a text of gratitude, you know, appreciation, or a sincere love. Think of somebody right now, and even in your mind, say, who needs a text from me right now? And send just a pure, just random text of kindness. Who needs that? So take 30 seconds to do that. Send somebody a text that needs it. Here's my picture for the day. Bam. Some of you will receive a text back that is like, uh, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, so you're like, who is this? Or what do you need? Or yeah, some. <laughs> Did you say you just send you a text? Now, if you want to be really happy for the next, try it for even three days, I dare you. Text, text two before 10. Text two people before 10 a.m. A sincere text of kindness, gratitude, love, Say, hey, you know, just thinking about you. Hope you're doing well. Try that. And I've done that. I've done all these. I've tried these. This one I love. I love to do just random text. Hey, just checking in on you. Hey, thanks so much. Or a former high school teacher or a former church leader, whoever it is, send just a random text of kindness. Yeah, kindness. In fact, of all these 10 happy hacks, here's the golden one. Because Martin Seligman, he said, doing a kind act produces the single most reliable momentary increase in well-being of any exercise that we have tested. They've done all kinds of studies, and they can't beat this one, that when you do kindness, it increases well-being and happiness more than any of them. So here's a good friend of mine, Ryan Hatcher, down in Arizona. His family, they'll get on and say, hey, Siri, what, you know, what day is today? Today is National Crossing Guard Appreciation Day. Oh, sweet. So then they'll put things together, and him and the kids will go out and just deliver random acts of kindness to people. Mm-hmm. Happiness. Boost happiness. Journaling. Journaling. Jur- the five-minute journal. Those who journal get to relive it in their moment, and it cements it in your brain. So the power of journaling, and it doesn't even have to be in a real journal. They've done a study with napkins. They just wrote three good things that happened to them day, that day and why they happened. And then they threw the napkin away and they had the same amount of happiness as those who kept the journal in a real journal. Because it's the process of your brain going back. Three good things and why they happened that day. Oh, yes. So journaling is, is a powerful one. Finding flow. <laughs> finding flow. Finding flow. <laughs> flow is that activity that you immerse yourself in all 40 bits and you almost lose track of time. You're just so immersed in that activity. Kind of like milk and cows. You just start going and you're like, Oh, wow, six hours have gone by. No. These types of activities, flow activities, finding flow where all 40 bits, that is really, it's the activity that kind of stretches you a little bit, but you accomplish things. It can be at work. It can be at play. It can be up skiing or playing the piano or puzzles or woodworking or painting or anything where you're so immersed in it. My, my son's like, Dad, Fortnite is my flow. And I'm like, no, 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 no. No, he's taking advantage of all my studies and research. <laughs> Okay, I'll skip, I'll skip some of these codes. This is the bonus. The, so this, I gave you 10. Here's the 11th one because I'm that kind of guy. Start your day in a positive way. You start your day. There's research that shows if you start your day with three minutes of negative news. You turn on CNN or whatever, and you're just going through. You're like, oh, man, look at all this is happening in the world. It's all negative. Three minutes of negative news. You start your day with three minutes of negative news. There's a 26% more chance that you will rate your day as a bad day at the end of the day. When you start your day negatively. Start your day positive. Start your day by exercise or yoga or a good meal or journal or whatever it is, reading or meditation or prayer, whatever you do, start your day in a positive way. It tends to set that trajectory for the entire entire day. Okay, so I'll wrap up with a few of my Dave's faves. Here are some of my, just a handful of my favorite 
books on happiness. I just added this one. This is the best book I've ever read on depression and uh, kind of anxiety. Depression and anxiety. Uh, the Oprah's File by Alex Korb. Make sure you get me in the picture. <laughs> okay. The Oprah's File, Alex Korb. I, I honestly buy this one by the dozens on Amazon, and I just give it away. I just give it away because it's so, so stinking good. So buy that one. It's written by a neuroscientist, UCLA. I'm trying to get him actually to come to Utah State to, to come talk. But it's written in a great, engaging way. It's not this thick, enormous read. Really, really good. And it's all kinds of these real hacks that he's done studies on that improve um, depression, anxiety, stress. So that was super great. Blinkist, have you heard of Blinkist? My new favorite app. You can listen to books, but it's the 15-minute version of the book. It's not the entire book. Sometimes you'll be like, oh, man, where am I? What is this? But I listen to books when I travel. Three, I listen to over 180 books. The 15-minute version of the book. And if I really like it, then I'll buy it. Super cool. Yeah, Blinkist. Some of my favorite app, uh, podcasts and apps and stuff. So I listen to a lot of this as I, as I travel. Live Happy Now, super one I listen a lot to. Headspace Calm. There's all kinds of them. And you could add to this list and I could add. So this is growing. But these are some of those that, yeah, oh, man. You could download this or listen to this. And great, great topics. research based. A lot of that Live Happy Now is scholars that come in and talk about um, happy hacks and gratitude and kindness and wonderful areas. So these are a few of my uh, favorites here. Did everyone get it? Fix? Okay. The overall, this is me. Can you see the resemblance? Yeah, I just shaved. People like, people like happy people. We do. People like happy people. We learn from them better. They're more engaging. And kids like happy parents, don't they? They really do. Kids like What's the number one crusher of kids' happiness? You are. Yeah, you. It's parents. Parents. They're smiling. Kids smile up to 400 times per day. Up to 400 times per day, those kiddos. Lots of smiling. So I'll leave you with some motivating oh, some, uh, words from our eight-year-old daughter. Have you ever had that day when you can't get your kid to bed fast enough? You're just like, okay, I'm done. Stay in your bed. Stay in your bed. Dang it. And you start threatening them. And, oh, I'm going to sell you on eBay if you don't stay in your bed. And you're like, okay, okay. Here, $20 bill for everybody that stays in your bed. Like, don't come out. So it was one of those days. And I God, get them to bed. And I go back to my room. And I'm just like, oh, God. Five minutes later, I hear, boom, 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 come right up to my door. I'm like, you're kidding me. Then I hear something on the door. I bark, get back to your room. And I go and I open up the door, and there's a note. There's a note from my eight-year-old daughter, Chandler. And this is a picture of the actual note. Some of you have seen this. It says, thanks a lot. I know it can be hard being a mom or dad, but you got to stick with it. And, uh, oh, my gosh. Uh, so my child totally, right, 10 years of school, Dr. Dave, do I blow it? I blow it. Yeah, I do. I blow it all the time. And then she tells me, Dad, you got to stick with it here. And then it says, look on the back. And on the back it says, don't worry, we still love you. <laughs> oh, that's why I leave her. No, I love you too, but stay in your bed. <laughs> stay in your bed. So those are some, some happy hacks. I... I, I some of you follow me on Dr. Dave, uh, USU, so I share all kinds of um, happy hacks and family stuff and marriage stuff and parenting and all kinds of stuff on, on Dr. Dave. Feel free to email me. My email's there, david.shramusu.edu, uh, and I will. I'll send you the whole presentation. I have no problem doing that. Just give it away. Give it away. Give it away. There's more up here if you want. Some happy hack bookmarks, make time for nine, parenting bookmarks. If we run out, send me an email. I'll send you as many as you want of those for free. Okay, off to lunch. Let's do it. Yay!